right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Today, we're going to take a look at a formula for creating value with Lotus Software. My name is Eric Mack, and I'll be presenting this afternoon just a couple little bits of trivia about me. I've been using Lotus Notes since 1993. It's our company standard, and I'm an e-productivity specialist. That means I show people how to use information, communication, and action technologies to get things done. My background is in messaging, collaboration, and information and knowledge management. A few words about this session. I'm relaxed right now, but we're going to crank it up, and we're going to go through a lot of material in a very, very short time. We're going to move fast, and one of the things you're going to notice is that I'm going to repeat a lot of terms and concepts throughout this presentation. Sometimes you might see it as a graphic, sometimes you may hear it audibly, sometimes you may see it as an illustration with text below. And that's to re reinforce re retention of the key concepts. And I'll take your questions at the end of the presentation. So let's talk about the theme for the, the conference this week. On Monday, on this stage, they kicked off this idea of be social, do business. I'd like to ask, what does it mean to be social? We've heard all kinds of definitions, and I'd like to propose that there are two that embody uh, key aspects of being social and doing business. One is the empowerment of customers and users and allowing them to engage and interact with your business. The second is the empowerment of employees to collaborate, share knowledge, both internally and across the firewall. Now, we've heard all about the promises of social media. What does it mean to embrace social media for business? You know, you would think, not just here at Lotusphere, but at many conferences, you would think that if you embrace social media, you'll have solutions for all of the world's problems. And you know, we just might someday. But it won't be that easy, because there are certain things that we need to do that transcend beyond just installing the technology. And that's part of what I'm going to talk about in this session. So where we're going, we're going to take a look at the challenges of creating value as a social business. We'll take a look at some of the elements of value creation. And we'll take a look at a formula for value creation. That formula here on the screen, V equals KMT, describes how to create value from Lotus software by embracing social tools and all kinds of other um, activities that I'll share with you that we can do. So value creation, first off, what does it mean? Well, to every business, there'll be a different definition of what value creation means to them. For some, it's cost savings. For some, it's faster time to market. For others, it's the ability to engage with their customer in ways that lead to larger sales, or more innovation, or more products released, or less time to market along the way. And at the end of the day, it almost always translates into dollars. So when we talk about that, we're really looking at dollars. And so when we talk about being social and doing business, we're talking about leveraging these tools, technologies, processes to increase business revenue. Now, at a former Lotus Sphere, Mike Roden shared this quote, and I loved it. It was, all CEOs that I have talked to have the same business problem. They've squeezed all of the value out of cost cutting. Then now they have their eye on people's productivity. Whether they call it collaboration or not, or social business, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for ways to create value. Now, the benefit of using social tools to create value is that we can more rapidly touch everyone in the organization. So the return on investment is greater, and the contribution in terms of knowledge sharing is greatly increased. So some of the things that Mike Rodin shared the other day about being social and what that means to businesses were these three points, the need to deepen client relationships, the ability to drive operational efficiencies, and the ability to optimize the workforce. There are many challenges to creating value, however, and there, they, these come in a variety of forms. Part of it is the fact that our work is constantly changing, and the tools that we're using are changing. So we constantly have to adapt and recalibrate. We're also visible all the time. 
I, if I were to ask for a show of hands, you know, every one of you has a mobile device and you're probably checking it and engaging back and forth with the office, your social networks, and your colleagues. So this always on connected ability changes the nature of work. And finally, the fire hose of information and communication available or coming at you can lead to a sense of overwhelm resulting in little action. <clears throat> what I want to do now is present a formula that will help you evaluate value creation in the enterprise. It will help you evaluate decision making about the tools and technologies that you deploy. And it will help you understand what's going on when things don't go well or the way that you plan. First, we have to cover some vocabulary. So I mentioned that we're going to go fast, and I mentioned that I will repeat several of these concepts throughout the presentation so that you get them and see them in a different light. So first, just some general definitions. Knowledge, that stuff in your head, what you know. Knowledge can come in various forms. You can have tacit knowledge, which is what I have and I can share. I can have explicit knowledge. That happens when I codify it and write it down and get it into a database and share it by some other means. But in all cases, the, the source of knowledge is experience. And the value of social business is the opportunity to share that experience within the organization and across the firewall. Now, I do a lot of consulting and coaching in the area of personal knowledge management. And I've crafted this working definition that talks about what knowledge work is. And so to me, knowledge work is the ability to bring together what I know who I know and what they know to consistently solve problems, innovate, and create value. However, knowledge work is inherently personal. Even in years past when the conference would always talk about collaboration and us getting together to collaborate, at the end of the day, what happens? You go back to your desk and you carry out an action. So knowledge work is inherently personal, despite the fact that we're collaborating or now socializing uh, using a variety of tools. One of the challenges is that we've not been taught to use all of these tools effectively for knowledge work. And to create value, we've got to have a formula, something that can propel us forward. So to, to create value, we have to understand the relationship between several different things. We've got to understand the relationship between what we know the tools that we're using, and what we're doing with that information. So when I come back and I look at the social network, I, I have to stop and take a checkpoint and ask, what kind of information are people sharing? What kind of knowledge are they sharing? Well, ideally, they're sharing experience, which is the richest kind of knowledge that can be shared across these tools. But they may also be sharing a process, fulfilling an order, completing a transaction, doing customer service. They may be sharing other important news, or they may be tweeting something relatively unimportant. My cat left me a present. Something like that. That's knowledge. Methodology. So methodology refers to a body of practices, procedures, or workflow. In other words, it's the how we approach the doing that we're about. Now, when we look at methodology and value creation, it's important to understand that you can be highly effective, in other words, creating value, with a paper and a pen, and, or you can be just as productive with thousands of dollars of tools. The key, or the differentiator in most cases, is what you do or the methodology that you choose to use. And that's important because I'm going to build on that in just a few moments. Knowledge, methodology, technology. Technology refers to the specific methods, materials, and devices used to solve practical problems. And these could be uh, high-tech things, computers and networks and mobile devices. They could be low-tech or they could be no-tech, paper and pencil. Let's go dig it a little further. And from a social business perspective, let's take a look at some of the technologies that are being embraced by businesses today to do business socially. In public, we have Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and a variety of other networks. And within the enterprise, those of you here at the conference, many of you are using tools such as Connections, or Quicker, or Lotus Notes, or Lotus Live in the enterprise. Now, those are great technologies, but there are challenges. There are several impediments to doing business socially. And the impediments are that you now have more information 
more communication, more actions than ever before are coming at you. So it really is this fire hose of activity coming at you. And in order for collaboration to continue to work and in order for us to get things done productively, we're going to have to find ways to adapt and work effectively with those tools. And that's what this talk is about. With the challenges ahead of us, we are dealing with many opportunities, the need to think about the work that you're doing, and how to keep up. So just to recap something we stated earlier, to be effective in creating value, you have to have the right tools for the job, you have to know how and when to use them, and you have to have an understanding of the outcome that you're going to work on. So while we're talking about outcomes, here's the formula. V equals KMT. So V stands for value, K stands for knowledge, which is that familiarity or awareness of how to do something, experience, I like to call it information in context. The M refers to methodology, as we mentioned earlier, that's those practices about how you approach your work. And the T refers to specific methods or materials and devices that you might use to solve the problem. So you're going to hear me use the words technology and tools interchangeably, but there, I actually like to make a distinction, and you'll hear me explain that in just a moment. So quick question. Let's do a review, get some audience engagement. What's the formula for value creation? A show of hand. OK, maybe it'll be more interesting if we open this up. OK, the formula for value creation. There you go. Congratulations. OK, value equals knowledge times methodology times technology. V equals KMT. Now let's dig into this a little bit further. These factors are multipliers. In other words, every one of these factors can contribute positively or, or become adverse to the output that we're trying to create. Have you ever bought a tool that didn't quite work out for you and you actually became less productive? Sure, it happens all the time. Have you ever bought a tool that you know works well because somebody else is getting results with it, but you're not getting the same result? Perhaps it's something to do with how you're using it, the methodology, or your understanding of how to use it. So the point to take away here is that these are multipliers. Any one of these can add or subtract to the total output by way of multiplication. It's also important to understand that these are not equal in impact. So the K, the M, and the T do not hold the same multiplier effect or the same coefficient for the output that they are creating. Let's take a look at this a different way. In my experience, the K and the M typically account for 80 to 90 percent of the value created. That may be shocking, but again, in my experience, the T typically contributes only 10 to 20 percent of value creation. That's not to minimize the contribution that T can make. That's simply to say that T alone may not create the value that you're looking for. So here I break it down, and I just want you to walk away with this point. The greatest win comes from increasing the equation across all three factors, but the greatest short-term win comes from the knowledge and the methodology part. And that is one of the reasons why social networking has taken off in the business, and businesses are embracing it, because they are extracting significant value. I mentioned earlier that sharing knowledge across the enterprise creates value. This is a way to do that. So how do we create maximum value? We look for ways to increase the contribution of knowledge, of methodology, and of technology. And when you do that, you're not only increasing the knowledge of the individual, but the team, the work group, and ultimately the organization. Now that requires some cultural changes too, right? You could think of the V equals KMT as V equals people, process, and technology. Same thing. And that requires that we make some changes culturally. For one, we've got to help make the transition from knowledge is power to knowledge sharing is power. Now, I believe that transition in the public space has happened um, very well, and you see it all the way to extremes that you're reading about in the news this week and last. 
However, in the enterprise, we don't always see it that way, right? There are some fears involved. Perhaps if I share my knowledge, I may not be here next week or I may not be seen as valuable to the organization. But in fact, those who are avid contributors to the sharing of knowledge and education in the enterprise usually end up becoming the most valuable players. So it works the other way. So we need to make that, that shift from knowledge is power to knowledge sharing is power. One of the neat things about knowledge sharing is you can give it away all day long and you don't end up with any less than what you started with. Okay, but it does create significant value. All right, there's some ways that you can increase the knowledge. One is training. I know that with the economy, the training budgets have been hit pretty hard, but that still has a significant return on investment. Socialization of ideas. Well, again, here at Lotusphere, we're talking about social tools and the ability to share knowledge that way, so that can begin to cover for some of what might have happened in formal training. Communities of practice and other social tools are also quite valuable. Now, when we talk about methodology, an important part of value creation is how we apply the methodology to our work. Now, I'm going to talk about a specific methodology only by way of example. It's one that I have personal experience with, and it's made a significant di difference in my personal and professional life. And sometimes when I do this, people say, oh, I don't use any particular methodology. But do you understand that that's a methodology in and of itself? It might be more organic, but that's just the same. So we all have a framework for our daily work, and some of us choose to approach our work in a strategic manner. That is, we organize the tasks we need to do, and we work after them based on the outcomes we've defined. Some of us, it's more coincidental. The email comes, oh, look, you know, the, uh, wasn't there the movie with the, with the dog that said, squirrel, squirrel, you know, oh, look, oh, look, an email, oh, look, an instant message, oh, look, a tweet from my friend. And so some of us tend to work a little bit more coincidentally. Now, I just submit that some methodologies may be more effective than others. So by way of example, I want to just take a few minutes to spotlight a methodology that I've used, and I've had the privilege of working with David Allen, the author of this Getting Things Done methodology, for the last 19 years. It's a proven set of best practices for knowledge work, and in the next few minutes, I'm going to give you five key principles that you can apply immediately. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to implement any technology, but it will dramatically help the multiplier M in the equation. Remember, V equals KMT? So uh, how many, by the way, have heard of GTD or the Getting Things Done methodology? OK, a number of you. Great. Well, for some of you, this will be a refresher. And for those of you for whom this is new, just take careful note of these five principles and see if this resonates with you. Before we do, I want to ask you to think about the inputs that come into your life every day. What kinds of things demand your attention? It could be those things coming from the desktop or the mobile or your boss or your assistant. In the context of being social, however, you have so much coming at you that if you're not clear on your role and the outcomes you're about to achieve, you're not going to get there. So that understanding becomes critical to productivity and value creation. So here we go, speed geeking time. Last night, I went to the speed geeking session, and they asked me to present the principles of GTD in five minutes or less. I'm going to do it in three minutes. Here we go. Do you have input? Stuff that's coming into your life, demanding your attention, uh, or distracting you from getting the things done that are most important to you. One of the things that many people report is that so much input begins to create a sense of frustration and overwhelm. Can I see a show of hands of how many people have experienced that more than once, perhaps even this week? Absolutely. So that input creates a sense of, of anxiety and overwhelm but I submit that it's not, well, let me ask a question. Um, I'm struggling because of the lights, but how many of you believe there's such a thing as information overload? Okay, information overload, a show of hands. Okay, I don't, and let me tell you why I don't believe that there is such a thing as information overload. Information is all around us, right? And if we went into a library, we would explode if information overload were such a phenomenon. I submit that what we're really dealing with is not information overload, 
but we're dealing with the anxiety that comes from not having made decisions about the input that comes our way. You see, I know that the screen behind me is yellow, the floor is black, and the wall is blue, but I subconsciously decided when I walked into the room that that was information that I didn't have to have any responsibility for or attention on. You can apply that same principle to your work. In other words, despite the fact that we're connected through the social networks and we're always on and anybody can reach us at any time, and we have Twitter streams and RSF, RSS streams and activity servers, we can be selective about where we plant our focus. And David Allen, whoops, David Allen created a methodology to help you organize that. And it's based on five key principles. Here we go. Principle number one, your mind is a wonderful tool for having ideas and developing them. But it's not a great idea for storing them. You see, when you store ideas in your mind, they rob your attention from what you need to do. So I can stay here and be completely focused on the audience in this presentation, because anything that had my attention, I was able to get it off my mind. Otherwise, as the saying says, the more that something is on your mind, the less it is probably getting done. Principle number two, decide about your stuff when it shows up instead of when it blows up. How many of you have more than a handful of emails in your inbox, and that's an average occurrence? Okay, I won't ask for how many have hundreds or thousands, but I know from working with clients what that's like. Do you understand that the challenge is, if you don't make the decision at the front end when something shows up, then you're, A, you're going to have to make the decision when it blows up, like this poor person's desk, and you have to process that information every single time you open your email or your instant messaging uh, resource tool or some other place that you go for input. By deciding about your stuff at the front end when it shows up and not when it blows up, you can make organized choices. And that's what we're going to get to next. Now, here's how you do that. Let me just get, uh, pretend that I have an inbox here on my desk. And I've just picked up a piece of input. So I ask myself two quick key questions. What is this? And what's the next action? In this case, it's a reference card. And I have four choices that I can make with this. I can deal with it now. And David recommends that if you can take care of it in less than two minutes, go ahead and do that. He calls that his two-minute rule. I can delegate it. I can pass it down the road to this gentleman and say, you're in charge. The monkey's on your back. And you take care of it. I can defer it by recording it onto a list where I know I will see it later when I need to see it, thus getting it off my mind, or I can dump it, right? Those are my four choices. Where the stress and anxiety and sense of overwhelm come in is when you don't make that decision at the front end. Because then what happens is your mind begins to look like this person's desk, full of incompletion and anxiety leading to stress. So, if you follow the principles of asking, what is this input, and what are the next actions I need to take, and you follow the step of getting things out of your head, the next step is to get it into a system you can trust. So you can do that in any number of ways. You can go low-tech, pencil and paper. You can write it on your sleeve. You can enter it into a PDA or mobile device. You can use Lotus Notes, such as I'm doing here. You'll notice that I've organized these actions by context, and what that allows me to do is to focus my attention on just those items that I want to see at a given moment. So Friday, when I fly out to the airport, if I get there and they tell me my plane's been delayed two hours, I can flip to the agendas list or the calls list, and I can knock out a few calls. I don't need to see the things that I can't take care of in other contexts. Very effective allows me to use the power of focus. In case you're wondering where I'm going with all of this, we're talking about methodology as a multiplier for value creation. So these steps that I'm teaching you, you can take back to your organization and teach in five minutes to someone else and dramatically impact their performance and the value that they create from the tools that they're using. Now, if you get things into a system, it's also important to review that system regularly. David Allen calls this the weekly review process. And that's where you push back the world for 20 minutes and you review your list. You mark things complete. You add new items that you've forgotten about. Or you delete things that are no longer relevant. The key is to personalize that list. <clears throat> David likes to say that he doesn't do any thinking during the week because he did all of his thinking on the weekend. 
And to a large extent, that's actually very true. He breaks things down into small, visible next actions and then executes throughout the week, choosing where to put his focus. Now, the benefit on all of that is that when you get things out of your head, identify the specific next action that you want to take, record it on a system that you can trust, and organize and review your list, you're then in a position to make key decisions in the moment of where you spend your time and energy. So you can make choices about what to do or not do. So that's a quick review, and that's basically what we presented last night at the Speed Geeking. I love this quote, you know, you can only feel good about what you're not doing when you know what you're not doing. So I have a list that I looked at before coming up on stage, and I know the things that I'm not doing, and they don't cost me no anxiety because I'm present here in the moment. Now, for those of you who are going to go back to your organizations and try to create value with social tools or any of the tools that you've learned about here at Lotusphere, one of the things you can do is apply a multiplier like this to the value equation so that you help those people get more value from it, thus helping ensure that your project is a success for your company, for your department, or your group. All right, so some ways to increase value from methodology. One is to introduce a proven process. There are many excellent processes out there. I just use GTD as one example because it's quick, it works, and it changed my life personally. Um, I just want to say one thing, and I, I took this quote from Zig Ziglar. A lot of times people object to investing in their people and doing the training. And you folks realize that the only thing worse than training people and having them leave is not training them and having them stick around for a really long time in your organization. So just consider that when it comes to value and methodology. Before we move away from the subject of methodology, I also want to talk about leading by example. Back to the theme of this conference, the social networking, I have three quick stories to tell about three remarkable individuals. So David Allen began blogging about um, nine years ago. It was actually quite by accident. I set up a blog for him, and it was meant to be a prototype. I wrote all of his posts. We did it in Domino, and I sent him a link, and I said, don't click on any of the links, or people will know that you're here. And of course, he did. A gentleman by the name of Robert Scoble figured out very quickly that David Allen was blogging, and he blogged and said, hey, David Allen's got a blog, and within hours, we had thousands and thousands of visitors. I get a phone call from David saying, what's going on? And after apologizing, and fortunately I, I wrote credible stuff on this proof of concept blog, I said, what do you want to do? And he said, let's roll with it and see what happens. Well, he's leveraged that social engagement to now, he's got him over a million followers on Twitter and an equally large list on his various other social platforms. But more important, by leading by example in his organization, many of his team are now following in the same steps. Most of you here at Lotus Fear know Ed Brill. I don't know if Ed's in the audience, but Ed also began blogging many years ago and really put a face on Lotus. And by being transparent and open in his communications, he wrote interesting posts at a time when most organizations were still evaluating, is there any benefit that could come from this thing called blogging other than a waste of time? And Ed will tell you the tremendous benefits that it has created for him and his organization and for the customers that he serves. Another gentleman who I like to follow, his name is Michael Hyatt. He's the president and CEO of one of the largest publishing companies in the world. And he too began blogging about 10 years ago. And one of the things that's remarkable is he did it at a time when there were no blogging guidelines. So managers and the legal team were saying, hey, we're, you're a public company, you can't be blogging, you can't be seen in public. And he said, look, I'll use good judgment, but I want to set the example that we can share what we know inside and outside of the company firewall. He then blogged through the process of creating their blogging standards, and now they have hundreds of bloggers within the organization, and they have boosted their revenues, they have engaged with their customers, and they have passionate, loyal customers. I hope what you're seeing, this, techno this session is a little bit different from some of the other ones you've attended this week. Most of my conversation is about how do you make the technology work for you 
as opposed to how do you implement the technology. There are a lot of people, fine people, talking about implementing the technology. But all too often, I feel, the topic of how do you get this to work within your user base, within your organization, that sometimes gets overlooked in, amidst the uh, excitement of whatever's new at a given conference. Now, I mentioned earlier that technology and tools, sometimes I use those terms interchangeably, and I promised you I'd come back and distinguish between them for you. So here's how I make that distinction. Technologies are pushed down from the top. They're part of the system. Tools are personal. They're picked up. They're mine. They empower. Now, if you think about what's going on in the social space, why has the social arena taken off like crazy? Well, it's taken off because it's become a tool that I can interact with others, but it's also my tool. In fact, if you think about a lot of the places where we've talked about get social or be social, and you were to substitute the word personal for social, and that's another theme I'll be building on, you would find that the sentence works. Because you see, when you make things personal, people embrace them as their own tool, and they become passionate about it. Try to separate an iPhone from an Apple fan, and you know what I mean. So you can have a variety of tools in your toolkit, and those that you adopt and embrace personally become the ones that you become most effective at using and the ones that you'll return to most frequently. So when you're working with your staff or your teams and you're helping them, Look for ways to make those tools and the implementation of them personal as well. Because to be effective, you have to have the right tools for the job, and you have to know how and when to use them. And the most important thing is to choose the right tool for the job. Another illustration, just to, to drive home the point of personal, deals with computer gamers, right? What is it about computer gaming that is so attractive? Well, it's personal, it's customized, I get recognition for my contribution, and it's really hard to take it away from them. And yet companies spend huge amounts of money deploying new technologies, and they encounter all kinds of problems with user adoption. Precisely because it isn't personal, it isn't customized, the efforts sometimes aren't recognized, and the people are like, sure, get rid of it. Tools are personal, technologies are part of the system. So a key concept here is to make the tools, the technologies into the tools personal so that your users become passionate about them. So when we go back and we think about some of the typical enterprise tools that are available, users don't usually embrace those, do they, as being their own. It's just something they have to do as part of the job. But when users see technologies as tools, they see them as their own. They embrace them and they use them. So, how do you increase the output of the value equation, V equals KMT? One of them is to focus on improving the usage of the tool, and the key concept that I hope you'll take away is to make that tool personal. Here's another illustration. We've had a number of tools available for some time, and yet users continue to use email. And there's all kinds of reasons why they use email. I'm going to propose that, that one of the reasons that they continue to use email, aside from familiarity, is simply that it's personal. It's theirs, right? If, I'm, if you give me a portal page, even if it has my name on it, it's not personal. It's not mine, right? But my email is mine, and I can work there, and I feel safe, and I, I live there. Now, we could create similar environments in other ways, but the key is that personal touch that you make for it. Forcing a system on users can lead to broken processes. This pretty much speaks for itself, uh, but the idea, again, is if you want to increase user adoption, help the users understand the immediate benefit to them, or if you're trying to get an approval approved for uh, implementing one of these new technologies you've seen here this week, again, when you're going to the powers that be, talk with them about the benefit that it can bring to them. So, increasing the value of technology, make it personal. Tools are personal, systems are not. And when you deploy tools, you might want to look at deploying tools with embedded methodologies. 
I won't do a commercial here, but I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. One of the tools that we created embeds some of these methodologies right in the tool so that users start using it and they begin to be conditioned and influenced by these best practices. And it's very easy and they start saving a lot of time very quickly. When you deploy tools with embedded processes, it speeds up the uptake, it facilitates measurable results, and it gives you a quick and ongoing ROI, just something to think about. So let's take a look at doing social in light of the formula V equals KMT. So I would ask you, if you're a business and you're about to embrace the doing social business as we've talked about here at the conference, consider each of these factors and their impact on the outcome. What is the T input? What is the tool or technology that you're going to use? What is the knowledge that you hope will be exchanged or shared through that technology? And finally, what are the processes that you're going to bring to bear to help amplify or multiply the value that is created by that tool or technology? Now you can also use the V equals KMT formula to evaluate and support or even refute decision making that goes on uh, about value creation. How many of you have been involved in one or more discussions about we should migrate from platform X to platform Y? All right, well, this formula will help you evaluate that conversation. You see, migrating to a new platform, as many of you know, won't necessarily fix the problem alone because moving to a new platform only replaces the T part of the equation. And T, as I've shared, often represents at best only 10 to 20% of the value equation. So you've got to look at the M for method and K for knowledge to fill out the rest of that equation to get the type of startling results that you're looking for. You focus on the outcome and then use the formula to evaluate the decision. I'm going to give you a couple quick examples. I've got a colleague who's a longtime notes user like myself, and he currently runs a consulting practice, and he makes most of his, his money right now working with organizations that have moved to Microsoft SharePoint from Lotus Notes or competing products. Now, why is that? Here's what he told me when I interviewed him. He said, Eric, it's because many of these firms dump Lotus for Microsoft only to find out that the value they were expecting never materialized in the way that they expected it or were promised. As a result, these organizations need to learn how to create value with a whole new set of tools or a whole new platform. So again, coming back to repeating this theme, the greatest wins that you can achieve come from the K and the M part of the equation. And even if you change the T and put in something else that does not negate the impact that methodology and knowledge have on the output. So this, the, the key point takeaway here, don't migrate until you recalculate. Sit down and evaluate those elements to see how they fit in that formula and use that as the basis of conversation with others when you're evaluating those migration decisions. I recently gave a, a presentation similar to this at KM World in Washington, DC, and I usually manage to share that I'm a notes fan and that I, I've used it for many years, and that usually gets somebody coming up and saying, well, we used to use notes, but we got rid of it, and we installed, in this case, SharePoint. And I always come back and I just say, well, how's that working out for you? And they frequently come back and say, you know, it was really great in the beginning. We loved everything about it, and they just gush with excitement and enthusiasm. I said, well, it's been two years. How's that going now? Well, you know, we're really having the same problems that we had with Lotus Notes. Why is that? Well, that's because replacing the T alone will not necessarily fix the V or create the value that you're trying to do. Remember the KMT. I told you I was going to repeat these concepts a lot. Here's an example. Restrictive features make a new system look more attractive, right? So in your organization, somebody's all excited about moving to this other product, whatever that is, fill in the blank. And they say, oh, we're going to use this new platform because this platform will let us create our own shared workspaces anytime we want. We can stand up uh, you know, our own web pages anytime we want. We can do all of this stuff anytime we want. We don't need IT to be involved. 
And IT comes back and says, well, you know, you can do all of that same stuff in Lotus Notes in our present system, but we had to lock it down for various reasons of compliance, security, or just to avoid cylinders of excellence, which is just a fancy way of saying silos, right? Knowledge silos. So the new system comes in. IT locks it down just the same way they locked down the current system, and the same problems remain. Is that a problem with the technology? No, it was actually a problem with how the technology was implemented or the methodology, the M part of the equation that impacted that technology's usefulness. So you see here, I could actually take this presentation and go to Redmond and deliver the same presentation because the same rules apply. What I'm trying to do here is equip you with the tools to make those decisions. Doubling T, just by extension of what we've talked about, even if you doubled the effectiveness of T, that does not mean that you're going to necessarily lead to a greater output or a greater value created. But if you do that at the same time as you also address the other areas, you'll see more value. Let's take a look at some quick pitfalls that you run into. Some decisions are made or supported by IT, and because we're all systems people, we have a tendency to gravitate toward the system part of the equation. We're going to buy this tool, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, or management wants to buy a system, right? They want to buy a knowledge management system. I have a degree in that, but 15 years ago, I was guilty of telling everybody, buy Lotus Notes, and you have a knowledge management system. Well, you kind of had a first generation knowledge management system where you could store you know, explicit information. But the point was, everybody wanted a system. And so there's this natural tendency to try to just gravitate toward the solution without considering its implementation or use. So just remember, V equals KMT. How to fail with this formula. Here are four ways that you can fail quickly and easily. First, don't look at the formula as a whole. Remember, they're multipliers. They don't have an equal impact on the outcome. Second, don't see the elements as multipliers. That means that any one of them can dramatically improve or adversely impact the output that is created. Third, believe that T is a greater contributor to output than it really is. All right, T is very important. We wouldn't be here at a conference were it not for T, but it's only part of that equation. And finally, forget that T is an enabler and think that it creates no value at all when, of course, we know that not to be true. Now, why better or great technology won't always fix the problem? I kind of made this point earlier. You know, and the key point here, I loved how Kevin Pettit shared this uh, last year, he said, don't fall into the right check equals magic bullet syndrome. And using this formula will help you evaluate, are you falling into that syndrome or have you objectively considered the very elements involved? So how can you increase the value contribution of T? Well, you can make it faster. Faster processors, faster networks, that's great. More important, you can make it easier to use so that people adopt it well. Perhaps it's an issue of unlocking more features. You know, as an example, uh, there are many organizations that think of Lotus Notes and they think of email and calendar when it can do so much more than that. But perhaps that's how they've got it implemented. And just unlocking some more features would allow that organization to quickly create more value with their existing technology investment. Staying current, training, and making it personal, I've already said. You know, as an example, I just threw this one in quickly, thinking about same time. Same time is a phenomenal tool for knowledge transfer in real time, right? And so if I were trying to justify it, I would talk about the value of real time knowledge transfer within the organization and if you've gone beyond the firewall to the outside. But its primary value is knowledge transfer. It's not just about the T. Right? There are plenty of people who get the same time on their desk and they don't even use it. So the value that they create, not very much. Now when you come to the M part of the equation, you're looking at let's say something like same time or connections, you could establish principles around effective use of the tool. What if you sat down and took a look at some of the best practices of knowledge transfer, just like I shared David Allen's best practices for getting things done, and you communicated those to your users? 
Now all of a sudden that multiplier effect goes into force. So that simple investment you made in the technology is multiplied many, many fold on the return. Another application of the formula is in problem analysis. Sometimes you'll hear complaints from users about something. System is slow. Well, again, I can take a look at that and say, well, where is it slow? Is it slow because of the hardware? Is it slow because of the implementation and so on? Is it slow just because of the configuration? Or is it slow because this user is really slow? Or because they haven't received training, the methodology and how to work with the technology? The key there is to evaluate it in each step. And remember that V equals KMT is the same as saying output is the result of people times process times technology. So a quick review. The formula for creating value is V equals KMT. I have one more shirt left. And who would like to offer an illustration of, of how they think they might apply this formula in their organization? Any brave souls? All right, we'll lower the threshold and I'll ask you to describe what does the KMT stand for? Okay, I heard it right there. There you go, enjoy. Um, so in summary, to create value, we must understand the relationships between what we know, the tools we use, and what we do. The formula for value creation is V equals KMT. And by thinking differently about your work and the tools that you use, you can become more productive and create greater value both as an individual and within your organization. I thank you very much for your time, and I'd like to be available to answer any questions. I also have some reference cards at each end of the stage with four steps that summarize some of what I showed you earlier about best practices for getting a handle on email overwhelm and other kinds of overwhelm. So are there any questions that I can answer for you? And I have to do this just so I can see. Yes, sir. I think there, are you able to come to a microphone? Maybe not. Okay, just so I can hear. Great, thank you. Well, first of all, your presentation was great. Thank you for that. And question is, uh, what are the signs to look for when it is time to update knowledge, I mean methodology and tools? Because uh, methodology and tools are not going to be good for forever. I'm gonna ask you to repeat your question one more time just so I can hear it clearly. Yes, uh, if I'm going to use the formula you just presented, right. uh, there is a time when methodology or tools have to be updated. Absolutely. And the question is, what are the signs to look for to ah, realize? Okay. Well, okay, so if you look at this as a, as a scale, and we have our inputs and our output, when the level of value being created does not meet your needs or expectation, then it's time to go back and reevaluate. And the key here, obviously I can't give you, the, you know, a date answer, but the key here is to look at the contribution that knowledge, process, and tool are each making to the value being created. If you look at things and you go, look, my people are sharp, they know what they're doing, uh, they've got a good work ethic and a good work process in place, but the, the system is just slow, or it requires 12 steps instead of two, then that's a great indicator that it's time to replace the T in your equation or upgrade or make whatever changes need to be made. So by having this formula, you can come back and do that. Good question. Any others? Okay, well I know it's the end of the day and I know you have one more session. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the Getting Things Done methodology, I'll be leading the birds of a feather at 545 and we're gonna have all kinds of drawings and giveaways and things like like that to share, so you're welcome to come do that. I can get you the location. It is actually here, 545 in the Swan Pelican. Thank you very much for your time.